The Wicked Sisters were now hurrying to Psyche's palace again, with the ruthless hate of Furies. And once more she was warned, Today is the fatal day. Your enemies are near. They have struck camp, marshaled their forces, and sounded the charge. They are enemies of your own sex and blood. They are your elder sisters, rushing at you with drawn swords aimed at your throat. O oh, darling Psyche, what dangers surround us. Have pity on yourself and on me and on our unborn child. Keep my secret safe and guard them, us all from the destruction that threatens us. Refuse to see those wicked women. They have forfeited the right to be called your sisters because of the deadly hate they bear you. Forbid them to come here. Refuse them to when, like sirens leaning over the cliff, they make the rocks echo with their unlucky voices. Preserve absolute silence. Psyche, her voice broken with sobs, said, Surely you can trust me. The last time my sisters came to visit, I gave you convincing proof of my loyalty and my powers of keeping a secret. It will be the same again now. Only tell the West Wind to do his duty as before, and allow me to have a sight, at least, of my sisters, as a very poor consolation for never seeing you, my darling. These fragrant curls dangling all round your head, these cheeks as tender and smooth as my own, this breast which gives out such extraordinary heat, Oh, how I look forward to finding out what you are really like by studying my baby's face. So please, be sweet mind and humor my craving. It will be bad for my baby if you refuse and make your psyche happy. You and I love each other so much. I promise that if you let me see them, I won't be so frightened of the dark or so anxious to look at you when I have you in my safe in my arms, light of my life. Her voice and sweet caresses broke down his resistance. He wiped her dry eyes with his hair, granted what she asked, and as usual disappeared again before the day broke. The wicked sisters landed together at the nearest port, and not even troubling to visit their parents, hurried straight to the rock above the valley with extraordinary daring, and leapt down from it without waiting for the breeze to belly out their robes. However, the west wind was bound to obey standing orders, reluctant though he may be. He caught them in his robe as they fell and brought them safely to the ground. They rushed into the palace crying, Sister, dear sister, where are you? And they embraced their victim with what she took for deep affection. Then, with cheerful laughter masking their treachery, they cried, why, Psyche, you're not nearly so slim as you used to be. You'll be a mother before very long. We're dying to see what sort of a baby it's going to be, and father and mother will be absolutely delighted with the news. Oh, how we shall love to nurse your golden baby for you. If it takes after its parents as it ought to, it will be a perfect little cupid. They gradually wormed themselves into her confidence, seeing that they were tired. She invited them to sit down and rest while water was heated for them. And when they had taken their baths, she gave them the most delicious supper they had ever tasted, course after course of tasty dishes, from spiced sausages to marzipan, while an unseen harpist played for them at her orders and an unseen flutist and a choir sang the most ravishing songs. But even such heavenly music that failed to soften the hard hearts of the sisters. They insidiously brought the conversation round to her husband, asking her who he was and from where his family came. Psyche was very simple-minded and forgetting what story she had told them before, invented a new one. She said he was a middle-aged merchant from the next province, very rich, with slightly grizzled hair. Then, breaking the conversation off short, she loaded them with valuable presents and set them away in their windy carriage. As they rode home, the younger sister said, Now what do you make of the monstrous lies she tells us? First, the silly creature says that her husband is a very young man with a downy beard, and then she says that he's middle-aged with grizzled hair. Quick work, eh? You may depend upon it that the beast is either hiding something from us or else she doesn't know herself what her husband looks like. Whatever the truth may be, 
said the elder sister, we must ruin her as soon as possible. But if she really has never seen her husband, then he must be a god, and her baby will be a god too. If anything like that happens, which heaven forbid, said the younger, I'll hang myself at once. I couldn't bear Psyche to mother an immortal. I think we have a clue now to the best way of tricking her. Meanwhile, that what about calling on father and mother? They went to the palace where they gave their parents an offhand greeting. The violence of their passions kept them awake all night. As soon as it was morning, they hurried to the rock and floated down into the valley as usual with the help of the west wind. Rubbing their eyelids hard until they managed to squeeze out a few tears, they went to Psyche and said, O oh, sister, ignorance is indeed bliss. There you sit calmly and happily without the least submission of the terrible misfortune that has befallen you, while we are in absolute anguish about it. You see, we watch over your interests like true sisters, and since we have had always shared the same sorrows and joys, it would be wrong for us to hide your danger from you. It is this, that the husband who comes secretly gliding into your bed at night is an enormous snake with widely gaping jaws, a body that could coil around you a dozen times, and a neck swollen with deadly poison. Remember what Apollo's oracle said, that you were destined to marry a savage wild beast. Several of the farmers who go hunting in the woods around this place have met him coming home at nightfall from his feeding ground, and ever so many of the people in the nearest village have seen him swimming across the ford there. They all say he won't pamper you much longer, and that when your nine months are nearly up, he will eat you alive. Apparently his favorite food is a woman far gone in pregnancy. So you had better make up your mind whether you will come away and live with us. We would do anything in the world to save you, or whether you prefer to stay here with this fiendish reptile until you finish up in his guts. Perhaps you're fascinated by living here alone with your voices all day, and at night having secret and disgusting relations with a poisonous snake. If so, you are welcome to the light, but at all events, we have done our duty as affectionate sisters by warning you how it must end. Poor, silly Psyche was aghast at the dreadful news. She lost all control of herself, trembled, turned deathly pale, and forgetting all warnings her husband had given her, and all her own promises, plunged headlong into the abyss of misfortune. She gasped out brokenly, Dearest sisters, thank you for being so kind. You're quite right to warn me, and I believe that the people who you were told you were not making it up. The fact is, I've never seen my husband's face and haven't the least idea who he is or where he comes from. I can hear him speaking to me at night in whispers and find it very hard to be married to someone who hates the light of day as much as he does. So I have every reason to suppose, as you do, that he must be some sort of monster. Besides, he is always giving me frightful warnings about what will happen if I try to see what he looks like. So please, if you can advise me what to do in this dreadful situation, tell me at once, like the dear sisters you are. Otherwise, all the trouble you have been kind enough to take will be wasted. The wicked women saw that Psyche's defenses were down, and her heart lay open to their attacks. They pressed their advantage savagely. The younger said, blood is thicker than water. The thought of your danger makes us forget our own. We too have talked the matter over countless times since yesterday, and have come to the conclusion that you have only one chance of saving yourself. It is this. Get hold of a very sharp carving knife, make it sharper still by stropping it on your palm, and then hide it somewhere on your side of your bed. Also, get hold of a lamp, and have it filled full of oil. Trim the wick carefully, and light it, and hide it behind the bedroom tapestry. Do all this with the greatest secrecy, and when the monster visits you as usual, wait until he is stretched out at full length, and you know by his deep breathing that he's fast asleep. Then slip out of the bed with the knife in your hand and tiptoe barefoot to the place where you've hidden the lamp. Finally, with its light to assist you, perform your noble deed. 
Plunge the knife down with all your strength at the nape of the creature's poisonous neck and cut off his head. We promise to stand close by and keep careful watch. The moment you have saved yourself by killing it, we shall come running in and help you to get away at once with all your treasure. After that, we'll marry you to a decent human being. When they saw that Psyche was now determined to follow their suggestion, they went quietly off, terrified to be anywhere near her when the catastrophe came. They were helped up to the rock by the west wind, ran back to their ships as fast as they could, and sailed off at once. Psyche was left alone, except in so far as a woman who has decided to kill her husband is haunted by the Furies. Her mind <coughs> was as restless as a stormy sea. When she first began making preparations for her crime, her resolve was firm, but presently she wavered and started worrying about what would happen if she succeeded and what would happen if she failed. She hurried, then she dawdled, not feeling quite sure whether, after all, she was doing the right thing. Then she got furiously angry again. The strange part of the story is that, though she loathed the idea of sleeping with a poisonous snake, she was still in love with her husband. However, as the evening drew on, she finally made up her mind and hurriedly got the lamp and carving knife ready. Night fell, and her husband came to bed, and as soon as they had finished kissing and embracing each other, he fell fast asleep. Psyche was not naturally either very strong or very brave, but the cruel power of fate made a viraggio of her. Holding the carving knife in a murderous grip, she uncovered the lamp and let its light shine on the bed. At once the secret was revealed. There lay the gentlest and sweetest of all wild creatures, Cupid himself, the beautiful love god. And at sight of him, the flame of the lamp sputtered joyfully up, and the knife turned its edge for shame. Psyche was terrified. She lost all control of her senses, and as pale as death, she fell trembling to her knees, where she desperately tried to hide the knife by plunging it in her own heart. She would have succeeded, too, had the knife not shrunk from the crime and twisted itself out of her hand. Faint and unnerved though she was, she began to feel better as she stared at Cupid's divine beauty. His golden hair, washed in nectar and still scented with it, thick curls straying over white neck and flushed cheeks and falling prettily entangled on either side of his head. Hair so bright that the flame of the lamp winked in the radiant lights reflected from it. At his shoulders grew soft wings of purest white, and though they were at rest, the tender down fringing of the feathers quivered naughtily all the time. The rest of his body was so smooth and beautiful that Venus could never have been ashamed to acknowledge him as her son. At the foot of the bed lay his great god's bow, quiver and arrows. Psyche's curiosity could be satisfied only by a close examination of her husband's sacred weapons. She pulled an arrow out of the quiver and touched the point with the tip of her thumb to try its sharpness. But her hand was trembling, and she pressed too hard. The skin was pierced, and out came a drop or two of blood. So Psyche accidentally fell in love with love. Burning with greater passion for Cupid than ever before, she flung panting upon him, desperate with desire, and smothered him with kisses, her one fear now being that he would wake too soon. While she clung to him, utterly bewildered with delight, the lamp, which she was still holding, whether from treachery or from envy, or because it longed as it were to touch and kiss such a marvelously beautiful body, spurted a drop of scalding oil on the god's tender right shoulder. What a bold and impudent lamp, what a worthless vessel at the altar of love, for the first lamp was surely invented by some lover who, wishing to prolong all night the passionate delights of his eye, so to scorch the god of all fire. Cupid sprang up in pain, and taking in whole the disgraceful scene at a glance, spread his wings and flew off without a word. But before the poor girl had seized his right leg with both hands and clung to it, she looked very queer carried up like that through the sky on a cloudy night. But soon her strength failed her, and she tumbled down to earth again. Cupid did not desert her immediately, but alighted on the top of a cypress tree by, where he stood reproaching her. 
O oh, silly, foolish psyche. It was for your sake that I disobeyed the orders of my mother Venus. She told me to inflame you with passion for some utterly worthless man. But I preferred to fly down from heaven and become your lover myself. I know only too well that I acted thoughtlessly. And now look at the result. Cupid, the famous archer, wounds himself with one of his arrows and marries a girl who mistakes him for a monster. She tries to chop off his head and darken the eyes that have beamed such love upon her. This was the danger of which I warned you again and again, gently begging you to be on your guard. As for the sisters of you, yours who turned you against me and gave you such damnable advice, I'll very soon be avenged on them. But your punishment will simply be that I'll fly away from you. He soared up into the air and was gone. Psyche lay motionless on the ground, following him with her eyes and moaning bitterly. When the steady beat of his wings had carried him clean out of her sight, she climbed up the bank of a river that flowed close by and flung herself into the water. But the kindly river, out of respect for the gods, whose warm power is felt as much by water creatures as by beasts and birds, washed her sore with a gentle wave and laid her high and dry on the flowery turf. Pan, the goat-legged country god, happened to be sitting nearby, caressing the mountain nymph Echo and teaching her to repeat all sorts of pretty songs. A flock of she-goats roamed around, browsing greedily on the grass. Pan was already aware of Psyche's misfortune, so he gently beckoned to the desolate girl and did what he could to comfort her. Pretty dear, he said soothingly, though I'm only an old, old shepherd and very much of a countryman, I have picked up a good deal of experience in my time. So if I am right in my conjecture or my divination, as sensible people would call it, your unsteady walk, your pallor, your constant sighs, and your sad eyes show that you're desperately in love. Listen, making no further attempt at suicide by leaping from a precipice or doing anything else violent. Stop crying, try to be cheerful, and open your heart to Cupid, the greatest of us gods. He's a thoroughly spoiled young fellow, whom you must humor by praying to him only in the gentlest, sweetest language. It is very lucky to be addressed by Pam. But Psyche made no reply. She merely curtsied dutifully and went on. She trudged along the road and by the river for a while, until for some reason or another, she decided to follow a lane that led off it. Towards evening, it brought her to a city, of which she soon found out that her eldest sister was the queen. She announced her arrival at the palace and was at once admitted. After an exchange of embraces, the queen asked Psyche why she had come. Psyche answered, You remember your advice about that carving knife and the monstrous snake who pretended to be my husband and was going to swallow me. Well, I took it. But no sooner had I shone my lamp on the bed than I saw a marvelous sight, Venus's divine son, Cupid himself, lying there to tranquil sleep. The joy and relief were too great for me. I quite lost my head and didn't know how to satisfy my longing for him. But then, by a dreadful accident, a drop of burning oil from the lamp sputtered on his shoulder. The pain woke him up at once. When he saw me holding the lamp and the knife, he shouted, Wicked woman, out of this bed at once. I divorce you here and now. I'm going to marry your eldest sister instead. Then he called for the west wind, who blew me out of the palace and landed me here. Psyche had hardly finished her story before her sister, madly jealous of her having been in bed with a god and burning with desire to have the same experience, rushed off to her husband with a story that her parents were dead and that she must sail home at once. Off she went, and when at last she reached the rock, throw Another wind was blowing. She shouted confidently, Here I come, Cupid, a woman worthy of your love. West wind, convey your mistress to the palace at once. She took a headlong leap, but never she never reached the valley, either dead or alive, because the rocks cut her to pieces as she fell and scattered her flesh and guts all over the mountainside. So she got what she deserved, and the birds and beasts feasted on her remains. Psyche wandered on and on until she came to another city, 
where the other sister was queen, and she told her the same story. The wicked woman, wishing to supplant Psyche in Cupid's love, set sail at once, hurried to the rock, leapt on it, and died in the exactly same way. Psyche continued on her travels through country after country, searching for Cupid, but he was in heaven, lying in bed in his mother's royal suite, groaning for pain. Meanwhile, a white gull, of the sort that skims the surface of the sea, flapping the waves in its wings, dived down into the water. There it met Venus, who was enjoying a dip, and brought her news that her son Cupid was confined to bed by severe and painful burn, from which it was doubtful whether he would recover. It told her, too, that every sort of scandal about the Venus family was going around. People were saying that her son had flown down to some mountain or other for an indecent affair with a girl, and that she herself had abandoned her divine tasks and gone off for a seaside holiday. The result, screamed the gull, that pleasure, grace, and wit have disappeared from the earth, and everything there has become ugly, dull, and slovenly. Nobody bothers any longer about his wife, his friends, or his children, and the whole system of human love is in such complete disorder that it is now considered disgusting for anyone to show even natural affection. The toxome, meddlesome bird succeeded in setting Venus against her son. She grew very angry and cried, So my promising lad has already taken a mistress, has he? Here, Gull, you seem to be the only creature left with any true affection for me. Tell me, do you know the name of the creature who has seduced my poor simple boy? Is she one of the nymphs, or of the hours, or one of the muses, or one of my own train of graces? The Gull was ready to spread the scandal it had picked up. I cannot say for certain, Your Majesty, but unless my memory is playing my tricks, I think the story is that your son has fallen desperately in love with a human named Psyche. Venus was absolutely furious. What? With her, of all women? With Psyche, the usurper of my beauty, the rival of my glory? This is worse and worse. It was thought, it was through me that he got to know the girl. Does the impudent young wretch take me for a procuress? She rose from the sea at once and hurried aloft to her golden room, where she found Cupid lying ill in bed, as the gull had told her. As she entered, she bawled out at the top of her voice, Now is this decent behavior. A fine credit you are to your divine family, and a fine reputation you're building up for yourself. You trample your mother's orders underfoot, as though she has no authority over you whatsoever. And instead of tormenting her enemy with a dishonorable passion, as you were ordered to do, you have the impudence to sleep with the girl yourself. At your age, you lecherous little beast, I suppose you thought that I'd be delighted to have you, her for a daughter-in-law, eh? And I suppose you also thought, you scamp, you debauched, detestable brat, that you're my heir and that I'm past the age of childbearing. Please understand that I'm quite capable of having another son, if I please, and a far better one than you, and quite prepared to disinherit you in his favor. However, to make you feel the disgrace still more keenly, I think I'll legally adopt the son of one of my slaves and hand over to him your wings, torch, bow, and arrows, which you have been using in ways for which I never intended them. And I have every right to do that, because not one of them was supplied by your father, Vulcan. The fact is that you have been mischievous from your earliest years and always delighted in hurting people. You have often had the bad manners to shoot at your elders, and as for me, your mother, you shame me before the whole world day after day, you matricidal wretch, by stricken me full of your horrible little arrows. You sneer at me and call me the widow, I suppose because your father and I are no longer on speaking terms, and show not the slightest respect for your brave, invincible stepfather, Mars. In fact, you do your best to annoy me by sending him after other women and making me madly jealous. But you'll soon be sorry that you've played all those tricks. 
I warn you that this marriage of yours is going to leave a sour, bitter taste in your mouth. He did not answer, so she complained to herself in an undertone. This is all very well, but everyone is laughing at me, and I haven't the faintest idea what to do or where to go. How in the world am I to catch and cage the nasty little lizard? I suppose I'd better go for help to old sobriety, to whom I've always been so dreadfully rude for the sake of his spoilt son of mine. Must I really have anything to do with that dowdy, countrified old boar, my natural foe? The idea makes me shudder, yet revenge is sweet from whatever quarter it comes. Yes, I fear that she's the only person who can do anything for me. She'll give the little beast the thrashing of his life, confiscate his quiver, blunt his arrows, tear the string off his bow, and quench his torch. Worse than that, she'll shave off his golden hair, which I used to curl so carefully with my own hands, and clip those lovely wings of his, which I once whitened with the dazzling milk of my own breast. When that's been done, perhaps I'll feel a little better. She rushed off again, and at once ran into her stepmother Juno, and her aunt Ceres, who now angry she looked, who noticed how angry she looked, and asked her why she was spoiling the beauty of her bright eyes with so sullen a frown. Thank goodness I met you, she answered. I need you to calm me down. There is something you can do for me, if you will be kind enough. Please make careful inquiries for the whereabouts of a runaway creature called Psyche. I'm sure you must have heard all about her with the family scandal she's caused by her affair with, with you know whom. Of course, they all knew about it and tried to soothe her fury. Darling, Juno said, you mustn't take this too much to heart. Why try to thwart the pleasures and kill the girl with whom you're, he's fallen in love? What terrible sin has he committed? It is no crime, surely, to sleep with a pretty girl. And Ceres said, Darling, you imagine he's still only a boy because he carries his ear so gracefully, but you simply must realize that he's a young man now. Have you forgotten his age? And really, Juno and I think it very strange that, as a mother and a woman of the world, you persist in poking your nose into what is really his own business. And that when you catch him out in a love affair, you blame the poor darling for those very talents and inclinations that he inherits directly from yourself. What god or man will have any patience with you? You go about all the time waking sexual desire in people, but at the same time try to repress similar feelings in your own son. Is it really your intention to close down the sole existing factory of a woman's universal weakness? The goddesses were not quite honest in their defense of Cupid. They were afraid of his arrows and thought it wiser to speak well of him, even when he was not about. Venus, seeing that they had refused to take a serious view of her wrongs, indignantly turned her back on them and hurried off again to the sea. Meanwhile, Psyche was restlessly wandering about day and night in search of her husband. However angry he might be, she hoped to make him relent either by coaxing him in their own private love language or by going down on her knees in abject repentance. One day she noticed a temple on the top of a steep hill. She said to herself, I wonder if my husband is there. So she walked quietly towards the hill, her heart full of love and hope, and reached the temple with some difficulty after climbing ridge after ridge. But when she arrived at the sacred couch, she found it heaped with votive gifts of wheat sheaves, wheat chaplets, and ears of barley, also sickles and other harvest implements, but all scattered about untidily, as though flung down at the clot of a hot summer day by careless reapers. She began to sort all these things carefully and arrange them in their proper places, feeling she must behave respectfully towards every deity whose temple she happened to visit and implore the help of the whole heavens, family one by one. The temple belonged to generous Ceres, who saw her busily at work and called out